Okay, so in this video I will be showing how to test the clock module for the transistor processor. The kit comes with full instructions that detail how to do this and you might find it easier to print off a copy of the relevant pages from the manual. The only jumpers you need connected are the ones that are specific to the board that is being tested. Um, I won't go through what they all are right now. We'll come to them and I'll explain what each one is as we carry out the specific tests. But essentially you take all the required control lines to plus 5 volts which disables all those functions and then you have all the data bus lines floating which effectively takes them all high. Once you've done that you set the dip switches so that just switch 3 is on. That will give us the slow clock once we've done that, we'll set the power supply up at 5 volts and I set the limit to half an amp uh, just in case there are any errors on the board. Notice that the ROM has been removed for the initial tests. We'll put that in in a few minutes. And then we can turn the power on. So once we've powered up, you'll see there are various indications straight away. The first ones are the clock LEDs are alternately flashing. It's a fairly slow clock with switch 3. You have the phase counter cycling, assuming everything's working. If it's not, then turn the power off and check all the connections. And because the data input uh, lines are all floating, the data lines are all high. Everything else should be off. So the program counter should be off, the clear should be off, opcode, argument and address lines uh, should also all be off. When you first power the board up it will do an automatic uh, reset and if I power it off and on again you'll see that the clear light will very briefly come on as we power it up and then it will go out as the reset is cleared. You can explicitly reset the board by pressing the reset button and that will clear every register and counter to zero and again make sure that all works before you proceed. So the first check is to make sure that all the lights are as they should be, which they are, and then we move on to testing the ring counter. Uh, this being the ring counter and we just need to make sure that when we press clear just the first LED is on and then it counts sequencing from right to left. In this case, it's working fine. Then we test the data bus indicators. These are really just LEDs on this board for convenience that show the current value of all the data bus lines. When you're inputting values to the boards, when you're testing them, never connect the inputs to plus 5 volt directly. That can damage the boards. If you leave them floating, they will automatically go high. So on the red board I've got here, they are just floating. These are the data input lines. If I connect one of the data inputs to zero, you'll notice that the corresponding LED goes out. And if I let it go floating again, it comes back on. So if we set all the lines to zero, that will test that they are all working as they should do, and they should all go out we connect them to zero volts, which indicates that we have a data value of zero. Okay, so they're all out. I'll set them back to floating. Whenever you're testing the boards, make sure you always leave the data lines floating when you finish doing any testing. That's simply because if you leave them connected to zero volts then other boards can't override that but if they're floating any board can take control of the data lines okay so they're working next is the address latch so over here this these uh, four leds labeled address indicate the current value that's been latched into the um, register that selects the memory address of the rom chip there is no ROM chip fitted, but the memory address latch will still work. So to latch it, what we do is look up the uh, LM control line. 
the LM control line is responsible for latching data into the latch that selects the address from the ROM chip. And if we look at the chart for doing that, it's the fifth connection along on the bottom row. And I'm here using the interface adapter. It's very convenient for doing this. So, uh, you can order that separately from the kit. Or well, you can just connect these directly to the motherboard if you prefer. It's just easier and clearer using the interface. So I'm using that for these videos simply so you can see what I'm doing more clearly. Okay, so LM is the fifth connector along the bottom row. So one, two, three, four, five. So it is the orange jumper. If I just temporarily take that to ground, these are all active lower controls. You'll see that the value that ends up in the address latch is whatever the lower four bits of the current data bus are. So what we're effectively doing is latching the four lower bits of the data bus into this latch. So these should all come high. Okay, so we'll do that. And yes, the will come high. We'll set the line back to high. If we now test it by selecting different values for the lower four bits of the data bus, so I'll set one of the bits to lower, you'll see we've now got 1101. And if I latch this register again, you'll see that we have exactly the same value in the address latch. You should test a few different values, making sure that all the bits can be toggled and latched successfully into the register to make sure that we don't have any stuck bits or any errors. So again, these shouldn't change until you actually latch them in. So we can latch those in, and that's working fine. So we'll move on to the next bit, which is the program counter. Now, if ever anyone's read the book, then you'll know that the program counter was fairly simple in the original transistor processor. In this version, it is significantly more complex simply because this version of the processor supports jumps. So simple jumps and conditional jumps, such as jump carry, jump zero, this sort of thing. And that implies that not only do we need to be able to clear the program counter with the clear button and at boot up, but we also need to be able to load values into it from the data bus. And that obviously makes it a significantly more complex circuit. So we need to check all the functions. The first one is to make sure that it can count. So it sets or is clear to all zeros at um, boot up or when you press the reset button. That corresponds to memory address zero. Now, normally it's under the control of the control matrix board, but obviously that's not plugged in, so we're going to test it manually here. So the first thing we need to do is to make sure that it will actually count. So what we need to do is take the CP line low so the CP line controls the counting of the program counter. It essentially enables the program counter to count. So CP stands for count program. And if we take that line low, we should see the program counter start to count up in binary. The right hand LED being the least significant digit. So the CP line is the bottom row third connection. So it's this white jumper. So if I take this low, we should see that the counter starts to count. So I'll press a reset uh, here, it wasn't obviously cleared properly. But you see it's now counting in binary, and it should continue to count for as long as the control line is low. Now normally it's under the control of the control matrix, so it would only count or increment once per machine cycle, but here we've got it running continuously um, under manual control. So I'll set that back to high, notice the counter stops, go back to low and it starts counting again. So obviously the control for the program counter is working. Make sure we can clear it, which we can. And now we need to make sure we can load values into it. So at the moment, because all the data input lines are floating, we have a data bus value of all ones. And it's just the bottom four or the least significant nibble that we are um, interested in here. So if I just um, toggle the latch program counter line then that will enable us to load the value from the data bus into the program counter and that is this line here so if I 
Let's draw that line. You'll see that we have successively transferred the value from the data bus into the frozen counter. It's not counting because we've disabled the count. Um, what we'll do now is make sure that this is actually latched by changing one of the bits on the data bus. So I'll tell that oh, as you can see, the data bus has changed, but the program counter hasn't. And we'll try latching that new value into the program counter, and that works just fine. And we'll now try to re enable the counting to see if it counts from that point upwards, and it does. Again, we can clear that back to zero by pressing the clear. So that works fine. We now need to make sure that we can put the value in the program counter out onto the data bus whenever we want to. Uh, that is so that the processor can get hold of the current program count value so it knows which instruction to load into the processor next. So to do that, what we do is we take the enable program counter, the EP line, low. And at the moment the program counter has all zeros in it. Make sure that we take all the data input lines back to floating so that other registers can take control of the bus. And what we do then is enable the output of the program counter. So essentially what this is doing is enabling the tri-state buffers to connect the program counter to the data bus. So if I do that, you notice that straight away the value in the program counter has been transferred to the data bus. And if we take this back high, then again the data bus is back into its floating state where nothing's actually controlling it. We'll just temporarily let the program counter count to a random value, and then we'll try to put that value back out onto the data bus by re-enabling the program counter. And again, that works just fine. So if we do that a few times, obtain a few random values in the program counter, and then allow that value out onto the data bus, then you can see that as long as we have the control line low, the value in the program counter is present on the data bus. So we know the program counter is fully functional. So the next step is to fit the ROM chip, and, and we're good to go. When the kit's fully built, this board will be right at the front, so it's easier to get to the ROM socket. But at the moment, it's second slot back, just so we can put the uh, adapter plate at the front. So what we'll do now is, again, power back up. And notice this time, we've got an argument value showing on the LEDs, simply because this is the output of the ROM. That's just the default value that was in there. In the instructions, there's a table that shows what the values of the test code should be. So this is the test program that's in the ROM chip and the kit supplied. And what we're looking for is to set each individual address value and then to make sure the opcode and arguments are correct as shown in the table. So we'll start off with address zero. Now it's only the lower four bits that dictate the address that we are setting the uh, ROM to or the, the data value that's going to be used to latch into the address uh, for the ROM. So I've set the data lines D0 to D3 or to low, which is address 0. And then when we latch this into the uh, memory address latch, then address zero in the ROM chip will be selected and we should find we have an opcode, an argument showing of all zeros for the opcode and the argument of all ones. So obviously nothing will change because that's what's there now, but um, we'll latch that. We'll set address one. So we now have address zero, 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 one. And if I now latch that into the memory, we can see that we do indeed have address 1. Argument is 3 1s followed by a 0, as it should be. And the opcode is 
one. We now look at the next address. So we'll set address two, and we should have an opcode of three ones followed by zero, an argument, all zeros. So we'll set that address next. So we now have address two. And if I latch that into the address latch, you see address range and make sure that you select uh, each address in turn and that the opcode and arguments show correctly on the LEDs. And that will make sure that all of the bits are functioning as they should do. If any bits are stuck or don't change as they should, then obviously check that you've got everything installed as you should have and there aren't any shorts or, or missing components. Uh, one thing I should point out here is these resistors in the bottom left hand corner allow you to change between um, absolute addressing mode, which is where the only the lower um, 16 bytes of the ROM chip are available. If you put these resistors in the other locations, or even just some of those resistors, it allows the output register to select which bank you're using within the ROM code. So effectively you can address 4K of ROM with this processor. That is essentially the entire clock module tested. If you encounter any problems or errors uh, as you test, then you should investigate them and sort them out before you move on to the next board.